Chapter 6 Heat Wave Hot, so very hot. The broiling stones atop the cracked mud shimmered warning signals to any creature foolish enough to approach. Trees with crisp dead branches curled and twisted in on themselves in a vain attempt at shelter. Even the still, dry air succumbed to the sun which continued to beat down. The sand basked happily in the barrage of heat, undisturbed by any breeze or moisture, celebrating another day of peace in the vast desert bowl. Emilia scraped her feet over the hard-packed sand, barely lifting the soles of her shoes above the ground. She had never felt so small, trudging through the open expanse of ankle-high, dirt-dusted scrub. So, this was freedom. She wasn't a big fan of it so far. Amelia hadn't realised how horrible struggling through the wilderness would be. After all, who would dwell on this? It was easy to forget the sunlight that fiercely burnt the exposed parts of her body, especially brutal to the skin long concealed underground, broiling it into worrying shades of red. The heat which had occasionally marked a brief period of freedom from Sawtooth's base now bit at her every will to keep moving, even stinging her nostrils when she breathed too hard, not content with just hurting her on the outside. Again, she looked back at the same view that faced ahead, which wasn't easy to do with only one open eye. The other was sealed shut by the big bruise with an angry sting. Clear blue sky above, rust-red sand below. With her limited view, it was all Amelia could manage not to get swallowed up in the shimmering sea of contrasts. Small flies buzzed past her ears, clinging to her bare arms as they crawled around in search of meaning. Some of them found it on her lips, settling down to suck at the tiny hints of moisture. At first, she'd tried swatting them away with her one working hand. Now she let them stay. At least she had company. Them and the vulture circling above. Best not to think about him. Amelia stared resolutely forward at the line of muddy brown cliffs, inching ever closer. Or maybe she only imagined them. She'd seen a line of water edging the horizon that turned into a desert mirror up close. Mirror? No, that wasn't the right word. A string of unmoving wind turbines waved to her from the glimmering horizon. One had fallen onto its side, two of its three blades sunken into the land, the third held up in the air, saluting the flatness trapping it. The car, emptied of fuel, was long gone. Amelia had no idea how far she'd gotten the Humver. Hopefully enough. Although, Sawtooth's Rock had water. Food. Shade. Everything she could ever dream of. Would it be so bad to go back? She would be caged again, but amongst the other women, Amelia was the favourite. Got to sit by Sawtooth's side the most, smuggle secret smiles to herself when he laughed. Such a special sound, someone's laughter when it's not directed at you. Especially his. The other woman might hate her for it, but Sawtooth would take special care of her. When she returned, the men would punish her, of course, probably no worse than the usual, and then she would just use the shell. Every time the punishments came, Amelia retreated within herself, to the special shell which had taken years to build. It was weak at first, and she vaguely remembered it cracking a few times under the pressure, but she'd rebuilt, over and over, from mud to wood, wood to metal, metal to... to an even stronger metal. Now the shell could withstand anything. As long as she had that and the double-barreled pistol at her side, even if its swinging holster bruised that side right now, then she was invincible. Amelia realised invincible might not be the right word as another headache pounded inside her skull accompanied by a throat as dry as the desert sand. Her right shoulder continued to throb where her arm swayed uselessly from the socket. The hand beneath was sore and stiff 
from where she'd hit Quidel last night. The skin scraped red off her knuckles, the blood on them dry and crumbly, falling off in tiny flakes. Waste of energy to try rub them clean. Her feet began to stumble, head hazy. She knew a few fancy words, always on the hunt to discover more. A secret power she stole for her own. Amelia remembered one, but people in the rock liked to complain about a lot. Dehydration. She was definitely dehydrationed. No. Dehydrated. She had to keep going. To reach the big concrete cube, whatever it was called. The one with the shops and tents and the free women. It sheltered near the cliffs, but how far did she have to get there? Could she even make it? Could go back. Amelia was still alive after all these years because of Sawtooth and his men. If she begged, after being given permission to speak, of course, then perhaps she'd be forgiven. Sawtooth would take her back, but could she trust his men to return her safely? Probably depended on who found her. Quidel, for all his frets, was too scared of Sawtooth to disobey him and hurt her. Hawker and Sonny wouldn't do much, just get the job done. Hush and daggers she didn't know well, but weren't too bad. Not like the four worst members of Sawtooth's inner circle. Screamer, Rammer, Fuse, and Firecrotch. The worst men she knew. The cruelest in the world. Regardless of them, she couldn't go back. A hum in the distance. Something different from the buzzing of flies. Emilia's thoughts snapped back, and the blurry wall of shimmering colours took form again. Her head throbbed as she spun around, scanning for the rumbling noise. Had they found her already? Now they were here, all she wanted to do was run. She couldn't go back, not with the riders coming. The sound came from above. Were they flying? She craned her neck. The sun had disappeared, blotted out by a huge, hovering shape. Amelia closed her eye, briefly enjoying the sudden relief from the shadow. Her wits popped back and Amelia took a step away from the roaring shape. Four fires spewed, two on either side of the main body, creating an enraged wind that whipped her hair and scattered loose sand around her feet. The shape floated closer. A ship. They glided effortlessly through the sky, and Amelia always wondered what it would be like to fly inside one. Away from the men, the ground, everything. But this ship looked different from the husks left to rot in the boneyard near the rock. Black and bulky, with legs curled to its underside like a set of claws. A boxy, red-tinted window faced her, reflecting blood-coloured sand. The fiery engines were attached to the ends of four separate wings, and from the centre of each wing drooped a blaster turret, all the same size as the one on top of the stolen Humber. A black and red ship? That's when she remembered the one thing in no man's land that Salthoof's men always ran from. Everyone did. From the flying army who had destroyed Salthoof's empire and now roamed the wastes looking for slaves. The rock had been bad, but this ship was worse. Worse than the riders. Worse than anything imaginable. The ship began to fall, the cylinder-shaped engines swaying and screaming. They grew louder, closer to the ground, sand shrieking as the heat blasted. People would come out of the ship when it landed. Amelia had seen it happen from afar. She turned and began to sprint in the opposite direction, her loose arm flapping. The flies fled in every direction as she ran, abandoning her. Amelia panted as she ran through the heat, drubbing sunlight, making her dizzy. She couldn't give up. This was her only chance. Had to ignore the pain. It would be less sore than being a slave. Just had to keep... Another identical ship swung down directly in front of her, engines thundering in her ears. Amelia skidded to a stop, too hard, and tumbled into a thorny shrub, sand, dust and stones scrabbling against her face and under her top. 
She pushed herself from the dirt with one arm, gasping, staring one-eyed at the newcomer. It took her a few seconds to realize it was the same ship coming to take her away. Amelia picked herself off the dusty floor and ran back the way she'd come, not caring if she headed towards Quidel, Fuse, Firecrutch, or any of the other bastards. Had to get away from the closest threat. Then she could hide and properly plan her next. The ship roared overhead and dropped in front again, blocking any escape. Amelia came to a stop, bent over and breathing hard, too dehydrated to cry. She turned her head and scanned the empty horizon. No wonder the flying army prowled the desert for slaves. Nowhere to run. No one nearby to help. Not that anyone would help her anyway. She was hungry, exhausted, in no condition to fight with her bare hands. Surprise was her best weapon in a fight, and she had less than zero of that now. Only one choice left. She made sure to keep her front turned away from the ship as it landed, bowed her head, and slowly lifted the pistol out of its holster. Her back stiffened as the fiery roar quietened, and the ship's legs opened with a creaking whine. Heard them stab into the ground and sigh as they took the full weight of the body. The loud click and swoosh of a sliding door unleashed itself onto the empty landscape, and two sets of feet jumped out paused, before padding her way across the hard-packed dirt towards her. The pistol trembled in her hand. It didn't matter how many times Quidel said it before. Today Amelia would prove she wasn't helpless. She made sure to keep her weapon in front, struggling to hold its considerable weight aloft with only one hand. She shoved the double barrel between her legs and cracked it open at the hinge attached to the handle letting the metal dig into the back of her thigh. The gun sprang open at the center, allowing Amelia to check the lengths of the two barrels. Smoothed metal bores stared back at her, daylight pupils shining through the ends. Suddenly felt as hollow as the tube sitting between her legs. She forgot to grab blaster cells in the armory. Stupid. So, so stupid. Maybe Cordell had been right all along. It was over, and she hadn't even left the desert. A free life had all been the imagination of a lone woman in a big, uncaring world. At least she wouldn't die of dehydration. Amelia clicked the gum back together, leaving it clenched between her legs, stared past her pistol's handle to a patch of scraggly brown grass in front of her worn-out yellow trainers. A fly buzzed lazily around it, surveying the struggling clump of life. Did the grass start off green and slowly wilt to such an ugly state, or had it always looked like that? Two more sets of feet joined hers, one pair of scuffed hiking shoes and a large pair of clean black boots. All three pointed towards the grass, forming a little gathering around the brown display. The fly flitted away. If only she could do the same. Jesus, someone's been through the wars. You seeing this blood? Looks like a dislocated shoulder too. A deep intake of breath, high above. I should have guessed something would go wrong, said a second, deeper voice. Aye, the first voice again, chirpy and grumbly at the same time. That's what we get for giving Rusk a task that can't be fixed with a shifter or a plasma drill. Where is he, anyway? Rusk. The name of the mechanic she'd hit. So, these men weren't with the flying army. They must have been sent by Sawtooth. She closed her eyes, feeling herself sway, too exhausted to fight. Knew it would only make more trouble. Did she fall asleep? Hello? Can you hear me... What's her name again? Amelia. She lashed her head up. The two men were taller than her, but the one on the right was gigantic, towering into the sky with a body bigger than Sawtooth's. He was the one who had said the name. Her name. Didn't he know it was against the rules? She stared at his blonde hair and deep blue eyes. Only one other person had the same colour eyes, although just in his right. 
and these eyes didn't have the same expression. They were sad in the same way the other prisoners at the rock were. That certainly got her attention. Amelia, was it? Now the other man had used her name too. She snapped her head towards him as he took a step forward. He looked small next to the blonde giant, with a beard that only grew around his chin and lips, and one of the palest faces she'd ever seen. Where had they come from? Neither of these men had much tan, despite everywhere outside the rock having a blazing sun on clear days. Sorry to scare you with our gunship there. It's great for warding off unwanted company, but not so much for relaxed approaches. So, Amelia, how does it feel to get away from that rock? You must be over the moon. She felt herself blush, not used to hearing her name in such a casual manner. The man with the beard didn't react. The sunburn must have hidden the extra red running to her cheeks. He smiled, furrows deepening around his eyes, and Amelia instinctively looked away, squeezing her one eye shut, waiting for the shouting or the hitting to start, the way it always did when smiles were aimed at her. Scary one, isn't she? What did that mean? It's all right. We're not going to hurt you. Lies. Amelia opened her eye and saw the big man's hand moving towards her. Amelia yelped and tripped over herself, landing on her bum, pistol skidding across the dirt. She held an arm above her head, knowing it wouldn't help. Jeez, I think you broke her. Another deep breath. I wasn't expecting this. What were you expecting? She's been in that bastard's clutches for her. Well, you know how long. Amelia heard an unzipping sound, followed by a thud on the ground in front. She raised her eye. The bearded man sat a few paces away. She lowered her arms, squinting at his absurd pale blue shirt covered in pink flowers. Here. The man placed a see bottle on the floor and rolled it towards her. She fixed a hungry gaze on the transparent liquid within. It's water. Go on, you must be dying of thirst. Quite literally, I reckon. He had a strange way of speaking. Emilia quickly picked up the bottle, wincing at the pain in her hands, uncaring if it was drugged. At least this was a nice, painless way of bringing her to Sawtooth. She unscrewed the cap and took a sip. A larger one, then started emptying the bottle with a lent-back head, clutching both hands to the bottle like a greedy baby gulping the lukewarm water. A dam burst in her throat, life-giving waves rolling into ripples of physical relief that flowed throughout her body as the thick sludge of dryness washed away. She stopped when she felt a trickle run down her chin, anxious not to waste a drop. She hefted the big bottle, scrutinising the half-empty container. Bet you feel better now. The bearded man rested his arms on crossed legs, lines wrinkling around the smile in his beard. Maybe he wasn't as bad as she'd thought, but there were very few trust-filled experiences to go off. Plus, the other man continued to tower with that huge height of his, ready to bundle her up at any moment. Do you want more water? The bearded man asked. We can give you more, but first, we need some questions answered. Can you understand us? Have you got a universal translator in your head there? Amelia nodded. She'd never heard someone she couldn't understand, no matter how different the accent. Good. It's very important that we find out what happened to Rusk. She hadn't tried to kill him. Hoped he wasn't dead. Can you talk? Gave another nod. Well? Trick question. They'd hit her if she said anything. That's how it always went. They hadn't given her permission to speak, and when she did? Well, she'd have to retreat into her shell. She only talked freely with the other prisoners at the rock in hushed tones after sundown. That was all. All she deserved. A breeze, the first of the day tickled the shrub of grass between them. The man stroked his beard and looked to his companion. The giant just stood there, blinking, and Amelia sat, staring back at the pair of them. Not exactly going to plan, is it? Looks like there's not much choice. He slowly shifted back to his feet, and Amelia flinched as he headed past her to the ship, 
where the four engines continued to rumble steadily in the background. The blonde giant continued to stare at Amelia, a desperate look in his eyes. She never liked that look, often spelled trouble for her. Amelia, we're here to help you. I'm sorry. The nameless giant reached out, and Amelia scuttled back, puffs of dust springing up as her only shield. He grimaced, slowly retracting the empty hand. It's no good. The other man trudged back. We can drag her with us if you really like, but I don't reckon that's a good way to start a trusting relationship. A hand grabbed her left arm before she could react, shoved upwards, sliding into her shoulder. She yelped at the jolt of pain, sprang back, and defensively brought both arms in front. The bearded man grinned. Looks like that did the trick. Her arm. It was working. She held up her hand and marvelled at the wiggling fingers. What magic had he used? As Amelia stood, something plopped onto her head. Before she saw what, a bag was thrust at her, making her catch it with the newly working hand. She turned the heavy bag by its twin straps, unzipped it, and saw three more large bottles waiting inside. The sight was better than a stack of gold. She turned her head and realised the sun wasn't as harsh anymore, her neck mercifully cooler. She pulled at a flap, hanging in front of her vision. That's a sun hat. It'll shelter you before you completely burn up. And here, appreciate you not using it right then. He offered Amelia the pistol, handle first. He hadn't seen the empty barrels. She took it and let it hang by her side, too heavy to hold up. Now, we were here to invite you to our humble abode, but we need at least a sliver of trust between us. We've given you enough to keep you going a day in that bag. All we ask for is you tell us what happened to Rusk. He paused. What was he waiting for? He nodded. Thought not. Real shame, seeing he's the reason you got out of that place. Was Rusk the reason her door was unlocked last night? She had assumed it was a mistake. Maybe she should say something to them, if they really weren't with Sawtooth. But the man barreled on with his talking, and the revelation sprang away with the new words. Now, if you insist on going your own way, I would advise heading left instead of straight. You see those cliffs? Lot closer than the direction you're heading. Amelia looked to where he pointed, gasped at how much closer these cliffs were than the brown smudges she'd been aiming for. They were close enough to see the sparse trees and large boulders gathered around the base. Her original goal. When had she started walking away from them? Either the desert, or lack of water, played tricks on her. Just around those cliffs are the Lugo apartments. Only place nearby where you can survive once that pack runs out. You better hurry, because they have a curfew, and once it's in effect, no one gets in. Head of security is real strict. You got all that? Ah, keep forgetting you're playing the silent act with us. The bearded man turned to his companion. Come on, no point sticking around here. Amelia still gazed at the cliffs when she heard the men turn to leave. She spun, shocked they would let her go like this, with all these supplies, free to make her own decisions. Not much choice, though. The Lugo Apartments. That was the name of the concrete block she'd been aiming for before losing her way. The first stop on her path to freedom. You know something? The bearded man turned and smiled. I wouldn't have the patience to slug through this desert. Never was fond of the things. Bit of a lifeless atmosphere, don't you think? The big man was already halfway back to the ship. He seemed easier to understand than the talking one. Emilia never wasted words. They were a rare treat for her to share, but this man in the flower shirt was happy to spew out as many as he could. Now stay hydrated. Best apply that sunscreen in the bag too. It'll make an average moisturiser where you're already burnt. And there's a blanket in there. Remember to wrap up warm tonight. You wouldn't think it now, but this place can have a shocking chill to it. Right then. I would offer to shake your hand, but I get the feeling you wouldn't reciprocate, would you? Nice word. For one starting with R. Amelia stood, backpack in one hand, pistol in the other, big hat drooping to the side of her head, 
staring numbly at the chuckling man strolling back to his ship. The big man continued to stare at her from inside the ship, so intently that she could feel those blue eyes of his. The sliding doors cut him off as the ship rose, engines flaring, legs folding, body turning, fires roaring. Dust spewed, and the weird vehicle, the one belonging to the flying army, disappeared into the dazzling sky. Like that, it was gone. A gentle breeze blew a scattering of pebbles and twigs against Amelia's legs. A soft whistle, and then silence once more. Quieter than before. Even the vulture had left. An empty pit suddenly grew inside her stomach, one not caused by lack of food. Was it a sensation she felt before? Long ago? Almost nostalgic. Was that the word? Quidel lifted his eyes, averted them as soon as he met his mentor's biting gaze. Dared to look again when he felt the eyes shift to the next man in line. His mentor stopped tapping his long pointed nail against the armrest encrusted with circular cutting blades attached to the chair made from buzz saws, hack saws, chainsaws, and longer spikier saws whose names Quidel had long forgotten. Saw to have stretched back into his throne, the saw blades fanning out behind him in deadly peacock fashion. He jutted out his lower jaw and pulled back his lips, a common expression for his mentor to adopt, one designed to show off his spiked front teeth glinting in the firelight that flickered from the red walls. The teeth complemented the craggy set of shark fangs that dangled between the many tattoos decorating Sawtooth's bare-shaven, oil-glistening chest. Quidel liked the look of his mentor's teeth, tried copying them, got hit by Sawtooth when he showed him the first filed-down result, who screamed something about stealing his image. He licked his one sharpened tooth, top centre right, tongue stinging from where he had bit into it had bit in frustration after he'd failed to hold the girl. The bitch hurt him, hurt his face and his privates below. Worse, she'd hurt Sawtooth's trust in him, needed to rebuild. Had a way to do so. After all, Sawtooth still had to teach him the many ways of life. He'd been lost after the Apoch, lost before it too, but Sawtooth had shown him the light. Goodell lusted for more. More teaching, more knowledge. Then he'd become the boss. Take over. Set in the saw-spangled peacock chair. Get access to the better girls. Maybe even the best girl. The only one Sawtooth kept forbidden from everyone else. But for now, she was gone. And the patrol led by Hawker had lost her trail. Rusk, bandages wrapped around his head, and Fuse, sweating like a no-man's lander with a mortgage, stood next to him in line. The throne room was hot. Quidel sweated under his black leather jacket. And cramped. Sawtooth was so close he smelt the wood-scented oil smothering his chest. Torchlight and banners flagged the throne on either side, displaying bloodthirsty sigils of skulls, bones, beasts, and other variations on the gloried theme of death. Quidel had thought he recognised the banners from a show popular before the Apoch, but Sawtooth assured him it must have been a documentary telling tales of real-life long-dead empires. The very empires that Sawtooth descended from and from the ashes of their legacies he had formed his own, before being smashed apart by the flying army. The red pointed face of Sawtooth's empire was smeared onto the black wall, painted using the blood of Sawtooth's enemies, stretching from throne to ceiling. Three lines, two for the narrowed angry eyes, and one for the wicked grinning mouth split in the middle. A cough came from Sawtooth's left, and he snarled, violently jerking the chain shackled to the throne. The chain's owner yelped as she was yanked by her manacled neck into the light, her oiled skin as shiny as the top of Sawtooth's head. She fell onto her knees. Quidel stared at the scantily clad woman, started licking his tooth for a whole new reason before Sawtooth's voice brought him back to attention. Fuse.
Sawtooth hissed, drawing out the name. Quidel glanced to his right and noticed Fuse's big bottom lip quivering. Wondered if Sawtooth noticed as well. His question was immediately answered. You look scared. Why is that? Sawtooth asked, the rumbling words crashing after one another in a slow-timed tumble. Fuse gulped. Not, not scared, Sawtooth, sir. Not scared at all. You should be. Sawtooth paused. Fuse sucked in his breath. Not of me. You should be scared of your own inability to find a single girl. I'll have to reconsider your usefulness. Quidel silently agreed. He had been barehanded when the girl attacked him in such a sly manner. Only explanation for her getting away. Fuse, on the other hand, had his electric toys and still failed to catch the runt. I'll start with a test. Sawtooth continued. Go fetch me some sweet tea and then report to the kitchen. Leave your weapons here. You're going to be the kitchen whore's dog for a week. Sweeping floors, cleaning dishes, emptying bins. All women's jobs. The lowest there are. Go, now. And extra bourbon in the tea. Fuse slinked his head, carefully shrugging off his infamous backpack and trudging from the room. Quidel admired the decision. Domestic servitude would hurt a man like Fuse much harder than any physical punishment. Doubtless anyone but Sawtooth would have made a better call. Well, apart from himself, of course. One day, sooner or later, he'd be sure to be the one in that position. Then he could... Quidel! Stop your muttering. Shit. Didn't realize he'd been making a noise. But people often were saying that about him. They didn't appreciate that there were too many thoughts in his head. Couldn't keep all of them to himself. You still have to explain yourself. Quidel snapped his head up, soaking in the words addressed to him. He was sought with star pupil, of that there was no doubt. It took a huge amount of courage to hold his mentor's gaze and to keep staring into the oddly coloured eyes. One green, one blue. You say you confronted her. Are you so weak that you can't stop a frail girl? Not at all, master. No one could get past me. Not in a fair fight, that is. The girl, she... Quidel realised he was talking too fast. Always did in his mentor's presence. Just couldn't wait to give him every word he could. But he needed to figure out how to phrase this carefully. She used... Dishonorable methods. Sawtooth chuckled, and Quidel's heart skipped a beat. Honor in a woman. You are funny. Sawtooth yanked his chain again, forcing the oiled woman forward onto all fours. Quidel hungrily stared at Sawtooth's pet. His mentor always did reserve the best ones for himself. She was a curved beauty, complemented by her long black hair, which scraped the floor. Sawtooth forbade his whores to cut their hair short. The woman whimpered as Sawtooth rested his thick calf muscles onto the small of her back. Give the bitches a chance and they'll take everything from you. They've done so for centuries, no, millennia. It's our duty to ensure the proper order is never flipped again. While Sawtooth crooked his head to inspect the woman, Quidel heard Rusk whisper next to him. Someone's been on the bad end of a divorce. Quidel gritted his teeth, annoyed at the mechanic's impudence. Such obliviousness to reality. Never had liked Rusk or his warped humour, but he'd fix his attitude soon enough. But. Sawtooth grumbled, sitting back into his chair, shifting the leopard-skin loincloth wrapped around his waist. My Amelia was different. Quidel bit his lower lip, thinking of the tanned little beauty. He felt himself harden every time he heard her name. 
Of course, he'd never disobey his mentor, but what he would do to her if allowed only a little... Quinnell, muttering. Not that I blame you for getting excited. She was my prized possession for a reason, and sure to fetch a high price from the riders. But you let her go. Quidel winced, but he wouldn't be deterred. Now was his time. About that master, I have some information that I'm sure will please you. Boy! How dare he not respond straight away. Boy! One of the double doors behind him opened, and the boy, Cyrus, came rushing in, sweat sticking to his spotty forehead. Yes, sir? Quidel smiled to himself. Only proper he be called, sir. Boy, tell Master Saltif who you saw opening the cage of the girl's quarters last night. Go on, it's not very hard. He's in this very room. Quidel grinned across at Rusk. The mechanic stared back at him, unblinking. He dare look bored? He was the one who did it. Why wasn't the boy talking? Well? Quidel glanced around. Cyrus stared, wide-eyed, at the girl underneath Sawtooth's feet. The boy practically had his tongue out. Even the woman who received this treatment regularly blushed. The woman's back gave under Sawtooth's feet, and she suddenly slammed onto the floor. Cyrus gave a shocked yelp. Fucking teenagers. Quidel kicked the boy in the shin with his steel-capped warrior boot, hard, and the wimp fell onto his knee, crying out and clutching at his leg. The pathetic sound was enraging. Quidel, Sawtooth warned in a low voice. The red haze shifted from Quidel's eyes as he withdrew his boot's second kick. He was always forgetting not to get too carried away with his punishments. Between sobs and without raising his head, Cyrus finally pointed at Rusk. Looks like today is my lucky day, Rusk said, his bored expression unchanged. Why, Rusk? Sawtooth asked, eyes narrowed to slits. Rusk, examining the dirt under his nails, shrugged. Guess you'll have to torture me to find out. Although I'm sure you'll do it either way. Quite handy, actually. I've been meaning to get my back looked at. Oh, don't worry. Hush will see to that, and much more. The woman cringed from the force of the last barked word. Even the insolent mechanic ought to be scared by now. Quidel stepped forward and could tell he'd done well, as Sawtooth didn't yell at him to go back. Good thing the boy came to him first, and not Sawtooth. Cyrus had waned on the idea of pursuing the girl, spouting some nonsense about letting her have a new life. But Quidel assured him she couldn't survive the wastes of no man's land. They'd be doing her a favour by bringing her back. Besides, what life could be better than one inside Sawtooth's rock? And I've got more good news, master. I had the Cyrus boy send out his drone. Found what Hawker couldn't. The car south. It's abandoned, but we've tracked her footprints, and I know where she's headed. I only ask you let me lead the party to retrieve her. His mentor's brow furrowed. Had he gone too far? Saltooth displayed his spiked tooth smile, and Quidel felt a wave of pure ecstasy surge. Approval. Nothing could have been better, and his gamble had paid off. Sawtooth never left the rock, and someone else would have to lead the search party. A chance to redeem himself. I like your eagerness, Quidel. So, where has she gone? Quidel smiled. The Lugo Apartments. There had been no footprints, the red dirt too hard. But in terms of walking distance, there was nowhere else to go apart from desert. He hoped the girl was smart enough to aim for the apartments. Otherwise, she'd be dead. And he really would be in trouble.